So my presentation today will be kind of in two parts, which I think with the slot right before lunch, that's probably good. We'll kind of break it up a little bit. Um, so for the first half of the talk, I'll talk about spotted lanternfly. This is a very recent uh, kind of arrival on the invasive species scene. Um, Kelly was talking about celebrity insects before. I mean, this thing, it is big, it is pink with polka dots, and hangs out in wine vineyards. I mean, really has celebrity potential, so look out, brown mar marmorated stink bug. I think there's only one website available at this time, but they'll be pro proliferating, I'm sure. Um, so that'll be the first half, and then um, because it's so recent, there really isn't a whole lot known about the species, to be honest. So I'll let you know what I know and what we're planning to do to look for it uh, here in Illinois. And then I'll kind of pause and take some questions if anyone has any, and then move on to velvet longhorn beetles. So I don't know how many of you um, attended this workshop in previous years, but I gave a talk on this beetle, I think it was four years ago. Um, so I'm not going to you know, re-deliver the, the presentation, but just thought I'd give an update about what's going on uh, with that beetle to date. Um, at the time we first had found it, there wasn't a whole lot known. Um, over the past few years, there have been some new developments that are kind of of interest. Um, so with that, let's start with uh, spotted lanternfly. Um, so like Kelly, I'm out doing these surveys looking for these things. Um, and like Kelly said, there's only a few of us kind of, you know, doing this as a, you know, what we do for our jobs. And so it's great, these kind of situations where we can get the word out and talk with people who are out in the field, working with trees and in the landscape. Um, the idea here would be uh, definitely to try to get your help to help look for these uh, insects and signs of their potential presence here in the state. Um, so as far as the origin of spotted lanternfly, um, I'll give you three guesses where it came from. Almost every invasive species comes from uh, Southeast Asia, you know, and it's uh, not really a surprise. That's where um, commerce moves. Um, the last couple of decades, most of the junk that comes into the U.S. comes from uh, China and other areas in Southeast Asia. So this insect is native to uh, subtropical latitudes of Southeast Asia, mainly China. Its preferred host um, is also native to the same region, so Tree of Heaven, a well-known invasive plant um, here in the U.S. Um, that is the preferred host. It does have a wide range of hosts that it can use, but it is a preferred host. Um, and so when you have the preferred host present in an area, it kind of uh, sets up a situation where you can facilitate the invasion of this secondary uh, problem of spotted lanternfly. So that's exactly what happened in South Korea first, and this is really very recent, just eight or nine years ago, uh, spotted lanternfly was first found in South Korea. Uh, in uh, Tree of Heaven, Atlantis, was, has been established in South Korea for many years, decades, not unlike its uh, status here in the U.S. So it was kind of ripe for the invasion of spotted lanternfly, and sure enough, just back in 2006, they first kind of reported the presence of this thing in South Korea, and they have found it in very large numbers there. Um, and so nobody really cares. It's attacking Tree of Heaven. It's also considered an invasive tree there. Um, but the problem is that it also feeds on other plants, and most notably, at least so far, uh, it's become a significant pest in grape production there in South Korea. So suddenly we found this new insect there, and uh, there's some research going on now in reaction to that. But prior to that, there really was no information really available that I've been able to find um, in the literature. So Tree of Heaven, many of you are probably aware of this thing. Um, I'm not a plant biologist, but um, just to give you a little bit of information about it, if you're not already aware, uh, highly aggressive invader, very good at invading uh, disturbed habitats, likes urban environments. I'm told it's everywhere in Chicago. I'm still trying to kind of get a handle on where those locations are. But it can grow even in little cracks in the pavement and things like that. This picture, I think, is from Brooklyn, New York. Um, a few very distinctive features that make it pretty easy to identify, uh, even for a plant novice like me. Um, the leaves are pinnately compound, um, fairly distinctive. And then to me, actually, what's even more kind of obvious once I started seeing some of these plants, um, what stands out to me is the bark. To me, is very distinctive. It's very smooth gray with these kind of like horizontal white lines up the trunk. You look up the trunk, and it really looks like stripes going up and down. And uh, to me, I, I don't remember seeing anything else that quite looks like that. So fairly easy to find. So like South Korea, as I mentioned, we have a very good distribution of this, uh, this plant in the US. I think it was introduced a couple of times, once on the East Coast and once on the West Coast um, many decades ago. And it has a thorough distribution, including 
uh, known distribution throughout most of Illinois. So again, we're kind of set, we've set ourselves up for the invasion of this uh, spotted lanternfly, and sure enough, very recently, so this is literally seven, eight months ago, this is really a um, very recent phenomenon. I had not heard of this thing before this time. Um, so fall of 2014, they found uh, the species in uh, eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, so this is just one county, Berks County, uh, eastern Pennsylvania. So if you can look at the shape match up there. It's just one area within one county at this point. They're still looking. Um, so this insect was basically brought in. I'll talk about its biology in, in the next slide. But um, basically it can lay its eggs on anything that is near a host plant. So that can include things like stone. And this insect, it's thought it was brought in on stone, brought in for landscaping to a company there in eastern Pennsylvania. Um, and so when it was found, they found it kind of in this, you know, I think they have six townships now quarantined where they found it. Um, it's probably been there for a few years. And actually the warehouse staff that works for this company that brought it in, um, once they found it and kind of got the confirmation and were told, you know what, this is actually something important. They're like, you know what, we've had that for years. The warehouse staff was like flicking them around playing, you know, football or whatever with these insects kind of laughing and these little pink polka dotted things. Didn't really realize it was anything to worry about, uh, just not knowing what it was. So it had been there a while, and uh, to be honest, I'd, I'd be very surprised if it's only that far distributed, but uh, we will see. They've been working through the winter looking for egg masses, and I'm sure a survey will continue, and we'll probably see a few more areas kind of light up on that map. So at this point, uh, this is the only known um, a place in the United States or in the Americas at all where this insect has ever been found. So it's not been found yet in Illinois, but something we're interested to look for because of its potential significance, at least in grape. So I just wanted to give a little background on the family. The spotted lanternfly is in a family called uh, the fulgorids. Um, they're known as uh, the super family. That belongs to, they're known, known as the plant hoppers, kind of loosely related to aphids, probably something you'd, you'd be familiar with. And so when I heard about this thing, I just thought a, an invasive fulgorid <laughs> from my classes years ago. I mean, these things are, I'm imagining this guy, you know, three and a half inches long, these crazy um, extended rostrums and... Uh, Check out this guy over here, almost cartoonish. Just beautiful things that are really only found in the tropics um, and really are not known to be agricultural pests. So it's not something I really would have thought of as something to look for. So it's just kind of an unusual, uh, interesting new situation. So it's not quite that wild looking, um, but it is no slouch. In the egg mass, not so exciting. Um, not sure how well you can see this, but basically this insect lays its eggs in masses of 40 to 50 in an oothica, and it's covered by this kind of putty-like gray uh, covering. It might remind some people of gypsy moth egg masses, for those who are familiar. Um, it is pretty similar, uh, a little different coloration. Uh, European gypsy moth egg masses can be a bit larger, and they're supposedly more fibrous in appearance, as opposed to spotted lanternfly that's more of a putty-like consistency. Um, so these insects actually have quite a bit in common. They're not related at all. Totally different orders, um, but they do have a few characteristics that are kind of similar, and that's one of them, that they'll lay their eggs on any kind of surface near their, their host plants. So in Pennsylvania, since they've quarantined those counties, the regulations they've put in place there look very much, I think they're exactly identical to European gypsy moth uh, quarantine uh, regulations, so regulating the movements of even lawn furniture and things like that. So those are the eggs, and then once they get to the nymphs, then they start looking like something a little crazier, a little more tropical, uh, something you wouldn't probably see too often in temperate kind of latitudes. Um, so they emerge as nymphs. Um, they basically climb up their host trees. What they do each day, they climb up, and they kind of hop down and climb up and hop down again. They do this kind of recurring cycle. As they climb up, they feed. And kind of like brown marmorated stink bug, they have pierced and sucked mouth parts feeding on uh, the plant. Uh, sap, and they consume a lot of this stuff. There's not a lot of nutrition in that in fluid, so they kind of run a ton of that stuff through their bodies. Their excrement comes out the other end and kind of can bury the plant. And so their main impact on grape is just mold developing from the honeydew covering the plant. Uh, so it's really the nymphs that are the problem uh, life stage in grapes. Finally, the adults, um, which I meant to pass this around, and I'll do that now. Um, I'm kind of fortunate that we had um, recently hired a technician who moved from Pennsylvania to come work with us. And so 
she very nicely brought us a couple of specimens of adult spotted lanternfly. These are very hard to come by, um, so I guess I'll pass them out, but be careful. Uh, don't, you know, they can get brittle when they're on pins, so I'd ask not to touch them, but certainly take a look at them. They're pretty cool looking insects. Um, so they have these um, large wings. You'd think they'd be good flyers, right? But they do not fly uh, much at all. They can kind of flutter to the ground. They don't like to, to fly. So their dispersal is really dependent on walking, climbing up the tree, hopping down again. They can kind of flutter a little bit. It's a little bit similar again to European gypsy moth. The females of European gypsy moth do not fly. So in that case, their dispersal is dependent on wind blowing the caterpillars around. In this case, it's uh, not so much wind dispersal, maybe in the adults as they kind of flutter down, but mainly just kind of walking and hopping around. Um, so, so those are the, the life stages that uh, you can see. And then the literature. So there's not a whole lot known about this uh, species, as I mentioned. Just a couple of papers out of Korea, since they found this thing in 2006 and they're having problems with it. So a few papers out. This one, I think, is uh, the most informative of them. Kind of a lot going on in this figure, uh, but I'll try to walk you through it. It's pretty uh, informative. So if you look at the bottom, we have the month of the year. Um, and then on the bottom here, the chart shows what time of the year you would find each life stage. So it's uh, one gener generation per year. The egg mass is the overwintering stage. When you get to spring, you will start seeing nymphs. They will molt through four nymphal instars. And then once you get to late summer and September, all you're gonna find are adults. Um, again, then in September and into fall, you, the adults will start laying eggs and you go back to the egg mass portion of the uh, life cycle. So that's the bottom half of the chart. And then on the top, also aligned with the months, it gives you an indication of how wide their host utilization is. So um, depending on the life stage that they're in, they can feed on a different set of hosts. Makes it kind of interesting. Um, so this line here, as we proceed through development, you can see that the number of hosts that they can utilize kind of hits a peak in the nymphal stages. They can feed on listed here, maple, um, birch, prunus. Um, also included in there would be grape. So during that period in their, in their development, they can feed on a very wide range of things and potentially become a pest at that point in time. As development proceeds, however, as they approach the adult stage, they basically go down to almost a monophagous species where adults are really only found on Alanthus, that's Tree of Heaven. And then egg masses are laid on Tree of Heaven, also on other host plants that could be nearby, and then on kind of uh, non-living things nearby like stone, wood, things like that. Um, again, this, uh, these kind of cycle diagrams, part of this paper was looking at that behavior that they have. Um, just showing that this is what they do through their development. They climb up, they hop down, they climb up again. Um, kind of unusual. So a second paper that I found, it was kind of interesting, and that's one of the main questions when we see a new invasive species is, well, okay, it's potentially problematic, but could it really survive here in Chicago? It's kind of cold here. Um, and it's, this is an insect that, as I mentioned, is native to subtropical latitudes. However, it's invaded South Korea, which is, of course, temperate. But this paper looked very specifically at the temperatures in different locations in South Korea and looked at the impact of those temperatures on egg mortality. Um, so over here, they show the three sampling locations in South Korea, uh, south to north. And then these two charts plot. The top one shows average, so mean daily, uh, mean temperature through the period of December through February in the three locations. Uh, so the southernmost on top, northernmost on the bottom. And then the bottom graph shows the mean minimum temperature, so the low temperature at night, December through February at those three locations. And then they looked at mortality uh, based on that. So again, though, they collected egg masses from all these locations. So even the coldest location has this insect, has it established to the extent where they're able to go out and collect them. There was a range of mortalities found, more mortality in more northern latitudes, but not enough to wipe them out. So just to give you an idea, I kind of looked up, you know, where is Chicago fallout here? Um, if you look, I looked this up real quick and I didn't look at it over the 30 year period like they did, but just to give you an idea, um, our mean minimum temperature, uh, December through February is around negative eight Celsius. That's about 18 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're really right in that range. And so to me, we definitely have a reason to be looking for this thing in this area. So um, I feel like spotted lanternfly is really well suited in a lot of ways uh, for visual survey uh, here in Illinois. Number one, the climate I think is suitable, 
But also, a lot of these species, um, you know, it's great when we have traps and lures, especially lures that work really well for these things. But a lot of times we don't have lures for a species or they don't work very well, and we're stuck with what we call visual survey. So just basically going out, inspecting the plants, and looking for evidence of the insect. Um, so a lot of times you do that because it's the only option you have, but you kind of wonder. It's like, if this thing is here, am I really going to find it? Um, and it can be kind of difficult. In this case, and there are a few other cases as well, but I think it really is worthwhile because the insect is so large, these things, as you'll see as this thing passes around, the nymphs are about three quarters of an inch long. The nymphs can be up to that size as well. Very big, very obvious. They don't, there's nothing around here that would look anything like that. Um, there are no native fulgorids to Illinois. I think there are a couple species that were collected way in the southern tip of Illinois, but up here you will not find them. So. You know, if you come by a plant and they have this insect, I don't think you're going to miss it. Uh, another thing going for it is that there's a limited host range, at least from that August to November period when the adults are out. Um, if you can find Tree of Heaven, you're probably going to find it because the adults strongly prefer it. And then finally, that host, Tree of Heaven, has at least a somewhat known, I know, it's, it's, you know there's a lot more out there than probably we have documented, but to some extent it is a known distribution. I can, I've been looking online and working with uh, Morton Arboretum to get um, some locations, and I'm building that map all the time, so everyone here, you guys are all working, most of you are working with trees. Anyone who knows where Tree of Heaven is, please shoot me an email and tell me where. Um, so we'll be working on that, but it is, you know, to some extent limited, so that helps us define the scope. We feel like we can do the survey and complete it. If the plant was kind of ubiquitous everywhere throughout Illinois, you kind of have to draw the line where you're going to look and where you're not going to look. In this case, I think we can try to look for you know, every known stand that we can come up with. So a lot of things going for it. I think it's worth looking for and certainly worth uh, getting the word out for uh, people like everyone in this room and, and others who are working in the landscape to try to, to find it, uh, especially with its limited dispersivity. I think it is worth, if we can catch it early when it comes in, you probably do have a good chance to wipe it out um, before it would spread too far to be controlled. Um, so this is that map I mentioned. I'm trying to build, this is kind of a work in progress, and I'm trying to add as many locations as I can to this map so that we have a kind of a survey plan for this fall when we plan to get out and look for the insect. Um, so the red dots here are known locations of Tree of Heaven. Again, I pulled that from a few different sources. Um, close up of the Chicago metro area. We are based uh, in Des Plaines up here. Um, so we'll certainly get to at least the Chicago metro areas and as many other ones as we can, try to work with some cooperators to get some of the other stands inspected further downstate. As you can see, quite a few records of Tree of Heaven, way southern Illinois. Um, blue squares up here, this word trace forward came up before with the P. Remorum uh, presentation. Uh, so same idea. We have found, actually you can see them better here on the Chicago metro close-up. Four locations, so one of those was a company that received material directly from the company in Pennsylvania that originally brought in uh, that stone material with the insects uh, from China. So we have one destination from Pennsylvania, and then we also have access, um, because PPQ used to work at the Port of Entry and we have a close relationship with CBP, we have access to their databases, and so we can look and see, take a look at what shippers were actually providing that company company in Pennsylvania with their material, and then pull records from those shippers and find out where those shippers are sending things in Illinois. So based on doing that, we found three additional locations, so warehouses in the Chicago metro area that received material from the same shippers that sent the problem to Pennsylvania. So it gives us at least a few, like what we would consider to be very high-risk locations. If we can find Tree of Heaven around there, those are the first places we're going to go this fall. Um, and then we're always going to be kind of on the lookout for new findings of this thing. Um, and uh, keep following up as, as best we can. Um, and then I also added on there some commercial vineyards, so that's not, again, not all-inclusive at all. I'm just trying to find them as I go. But um, I think I've got 25 or so up there right now. You know, wine, Kelly mentioned, it's kind of a growing industry. Obviously not a huge uh, part of the ag economy here, but it is growing. And certainly other states would not want to see this insect get established and potentially move around uh, from Illinois or anywhere else. So this fall, once we get this map together and our other trapping stuff winds down, another reason why I like this survey is because we can do it in fall when other stuff isn't quite so busy. Um, what we're going to look for in fall, again, egg masses. Uh, so this is the same thing I was showing in the previous slide. That's a fresh egg mass with that putty-like covering on it. 
But you can also, apparently, in Pennsylvania, they're finding old egg masses, um, which when they're two or three years old, you'll still see these rows of eggs, just kind of the shells that are still there from the previous emergence of the insect. But the shells, so the chorea, will actually stay intact and on the tree for a couple of years. So it has a little bit different look um, when that covering kind of withers away. But we'll be looking for both of those things in addition to the obvious big, beautiful polka dotted uh, pink things there in the middle. A few other photos I just pulled from uh, Pennsylvania. They've been working like crazy this winter uh, trying to delimit this thing. Just to give you an idea of the kinds of places they're finding egg masses. Um, so they are recommending strongly to take a look at any kind of pallets or wood material, fences, uh, lawn furniture, whatever, material that's near Alanthus, near Tree of Heaven. You can see the trees up here. Um, they're also finding them on stones laying around the ground, under bark on, on Alanthus trees and other, other trees nearby Alanthus, and just on kind of random hunks of wood and junk laying around on the ground. So, you kind of got to look everywhere uh, near the host trees to try to find these egg masses. Hard to see here, but he's pointing to one, and there's another one here. Um, so they're kind of finding them in pretty good numbers in that particular area there in Pennsylvania. So, as I mentioned before, um, we look as best we can, but we always try to get the word out too because um, most invasive species are found by people who are not formally looking for them. Um, so it's certainly good to get the word out on this stuff. And it really helps when, when um, agencies like the Pennsylvania Department of Ag really go after these things, and they have pushed out several really helpful kind of pest ID guides, uh, pest alerts, things like that, uh, really useful tools that we can get out to people so they know what to look for, why we care about it, uh, who to contact, and that kind of thing. So that's what I have for spotted lanternfly, and I guess I can pause at this point if there's any questions on this uh, insect, and then I'll move on to uh, velvet longhorn beetle next. Any questions? So how fatal is it to tree of heaven or to other species? Yeah, unfortunately, um, there's no known impact on tree of heaven. Um, <laughs> they, even though they can be quite numerous, um, it was actually considered as a biological control agent, this insect, when they found it in Korea, but they very quickly found that it attacked too many other um, hosts. But um, in addition, they found that, they, at least to this point, they don't have any evidence as having an impact on tree of heaven. Um, really, at this point, I think all we know is that grape is the main susceptible plant that it can feed on. Uh, I noticed the two trees forwards were near uh, where Forest Preserves of Cook County has property, and so of course we'll let you guys trap there. But I was wondering, if one lands on me while I'm in the woods, do I send you an email? Do I obviously try to trap it? Try to catch it if you can, and, and um, I'll come pick it up or you can send it to me. Cool. Um, but if you can't catch it, at least a photo. Okay. Again, there wouldn't be anything much like this, so a right. decent photo would probably be enough to say it was there. Certainly, we'll be looking in Cook County Preserves, um, like we you know, generally do, especially if we have a warehouse across the street, that kind of thing. Um, so again, there are no traps for this thing. We are out doing trapping surveys for other stuff, but at this point, um, I think they are using what they call sticky traps, but they're literally just bands of tangle foot that they're putting around trees as they crawl up. They get stuck in them. But other than that, there really are no traps available, so we're just really out kind of doing visual inspections for these things at this point. One more question. How many sure. times a day do they climb up the tree? Just once up and once down? You know, I have to look at the paper again. I think as nymphs, they can go up multiple times a day. And as development proceeds, it's more like once a day. Um, and there's no information in this paper about why they might do that, what the kind of significance of it is. But um, it's just something that they do to keep busy, I guess. Walk up, feed, and jump down. Maybe it's just fun. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I see they have wings, do they actually float or fly? Yeah, they do have big wings, but they, they do not fly well or they do not prefer to fly. That's why I was mentioning the warehouse staff was kind of flicking them around and playing with them. <laughs> they just will, you know, sit in your hand and hang out. They don't, they either cannot or do not fly. So they can kind of, the adults I think can kind of flutter to the ground from the top of a tree, but they do not use their wings for dispersal in a primary way as far as I've been able to find in the literature anyway. So I think if you find one, you have a pretty good chance of getting it in the vial. 
um, and sending it over to me. Whereas a lot of the stuff we're looking for is more like you got to have skills and speed and you know, catch that thing and get it in a vial. But this one should be easy. And would you like us all to send you locations? Yes, seriously. If anyone, I have my, on the last slide, I have my email address. So anyone who knows where Tree of Heaven is, you don't have to be, you know, if you have GPS, great, but don't, you know, wait to send it to me because you want to go to the GPS. Just give me a verbal description and that'll be great. We'll go out and see if we can't uh, track it down, just the intersection or whatever. But I appreciate it. Any information anyone has here, uh, we'd love to hear and just kind of build that, that database of places that we can watch over the upcoming years. I think it's very unlikely, I hope, um, that this thing is in Illinois yet, but it's the kind of thing where we know it's a problem and it's probably going to be something we're going to want to look for over the upcoming several years. So I feel like if we can invest a little time and get that distribution down, that will be really helpful. Anything else? Okay, I'll move on then. Um, not sure how much time I have left here before lunch is served. Okay. All right. I'll try to keep this a little bit brief. Again, I did give this presentation before. I'm not trying to redo it, but a um, few things have come to light, especially in the last year, about this beetle, and I thought I'd give a quick update. So just real quickly, this thing, last time I gave this talk was more commonly referred to as Chinese longhorn beetle. Well, it was decided that there are too many Chinese beetles, um, and they have to get a little more creative with the common name. So I don't know. The powers that be came together and decided, let's give it something a little different. So you're going to more often hear about this thing referred to as velvet longhorn beetle, uh, scientific name Trichophorus campestris. Uh, still the same thing I talked about last time. Um, so just a quick background on it. Um, this thing is also, this thing has a Eurasian distribution, more of a temperate distribution. So automatically you're thinking it's, it's a potential uh, problem for a state like Illinois. The dots up here kind of show uh, known areas where that beetle has been uh, reported. So Eastern Europe uh, into all the way across to Eastern Asia and into Japan. Um, never found in the Americas until 2002. Um, it moves around through trade like everything else. This one is a wood borer, so its larvae and pupae can be moved around in things like crates, dunnage, pallets. So not the stuff that really is moving in commerce, but the stuff that moves with the stuff that's brought in in commerce turns out to be the real problem. Um, so larvae and pupae, when they're not properly treated, by the way, the wood is supposed to be treated, but very often it is not or not treated well enough. So the live insects make their way into the new country, emerge as adults, and you have an invasive species. Um, so they were first found, the species, in Montreal in 2002, just a single specimen in 2002, another one in 2006. To my knowledge, they've not found it again there. Um, so Canada had it first. And then in 2009, it turned up in Schiller Park, in, um, right near O'Hare Airport. Um, a couple of traps there, uh, just two specimens that year. And then over the next couple of years, it turned up in Robinson, Illinois, very rural uh, site, about an hour or so south of Champaign. It turned up once in Minneapolis and two times in Salt Lake City at that point, the last time I gave this presentation. So this is what the map looked like last time I gave this talk. So fast forward four years, and a few things have come up. The Chicago story has continued. Um, we've caught it almost every year since 2009 now, uh, particularly in the Chicago area, although we did catch it a couple times down there in Robinson. We actually, due to budgets, we've had reduced staff, um, and so we have not trapped down in Robinson in a couple years. So I'm very curious. This year we've got our staff back, and we're going to have some traps down there, so I'm curious to see if that thing doesn't show up again uh, this year or if maybe it's going to kind of... Uh, fade away. Um, so it turns out, though, that Salt Lake City has become really the main uh, point of interest on the species. So it was found a year after it was here in Illinois. But as it turns out, they clearly have the most intense infestation of this beetle. Um, and I'll get to more of that on the next slide. A um, couple of interesting findings of this beetle, uh, one in Chicago and one in New York. These things happen within four days of each other, and they were very similar stories where you have a resident who calls the local agriculture authority and says, I think I have Asian longhorn beetle in my house. So Asian longhorn beetle is the other big serambicid we used to have in Chicago, kills maples and other, other kinds of trees. A lot of outreach out there on that, a lot of people looking for it, and we get a lot of reports. Um, mostly it's not Asian longhorn beetle, but sometimes it is. So same, same thing happened within four days of each other. They call 
I say, I think I've got Asian longhorn beetle in my house. And so we come running right out and take a look at it. Um, and so the case of Chicago, I went out and um, this guy said, yeah, it's a big longhorn beetle. I'm looking online, it has the white spots. I really think that's what this is. So I'm like, okay, I'll be down. He was right by Midway Airport. I'm in Des Plaines, not too long of a drive. So I'm like, I'll, I'll come pick it up. So I go into this house and uh, he's got it in a Ziploc and I very quickly can see it's not Asian longhorn beetle. It's not big enough. It's brown, it's not black. Um, and I can kind of, you know, just looking quickly, I could see these white spots he's talking about. And it, because of the spots, I wasn't recognizing. I'm like, you know, I've been doing this a while and I don't recognize this serumbicid. And then kind of looking closer, I'm like, you know, those spots are kind of like, they're not symmetrical. With beetles, they're usually, if they have markings, they're symmetrical. Um, and so these were kind of random all over the elytra. And so after talking to him, turns out he fished this thing out of his bathtub with toilet paper. And so little bits of toilet paper were kind of stuck to the elytra, giving a white spotted appearance. But once that kind of like, I could rule that out in my brain, okay, the spots aren't really there. I'm like, I think this is T. campestris. So he's calling, thinking it's Asian longhorn beetle. Turns out it's something else, but something we're interested in anyway. So very happy he called. So it's kind of bizarre because in New York, four days previous, they had almost the identical story. This resident fished this beetle out of their bathtub. So I can only guess, we know that this thing's attracted to light, so probably flew into the house at night, the door open, the light on in the house. And then I can assume in July in New York and Illinois, pretty humid, people run their air conditioners, and it's very dry. So I assume, just a guess, maybe they're going for the moisture in the bathroom, but who knows? Um, kind of interesting. So we are continuing to look for this thing um, with our trapping. And um, in the beginning, we just didn't know, is this thing important? There's not a lot of literature available on it. Is it attracting, attacking live trees? What trees is it attacking? We just didn't know. So we're just trying to kind of keep an eye on it and um, hope for the best. So as I mentioned, Utah turns out to be the most significant infestation of the species. Might be hard to see, but they have a table on the top there that shows 2010, 2011, 12, 13, 14. Catches of this beetle over that period of time I think this is a two-county area near Salt Lake City. Um, and so 2010, they just caught four, nothing in 2011, 11 in 2012, and then in 13, 142, and in 2014, last year, 408. So I think in Illinois, we've caught a total of 13. They had over 400 last year. So very interesting in terms of numbers, also in terms of what they are finding as far as where, they, where they're catching it, what kinds of hosts they seem to be associated with. So that's uh, coming next. So very interesting and concerning is that they are catching it in commercial orchards of peach and cherry. Interesting for a couple reasons. Um, one, this thing had a host list of about 35 genera, known hosts in its native range. Prunus was not one of them. So all of a sudden they're finding it in these orchards and um, turns out they like Prunus quite a bit and seem to prefer it in some way. They're seeing some dieback in trees. They're suspecting the beetle has, is playing a role, but it's really too early to be too conclusive about that. Who knows? These are primarily older um, orchard trees. Um, and then they show here some exit holes that they think are associated with the beetle. So uh, kind of a, a point of concern. And then again, there was not a lot known about this thing for many years. And so last year, the, the farm bill, uh, which kind of doles out uh, quite a bit of money for various projects in support of agriculture in general, and uh, some of those projects turn out to be looking at new invasive species and things related to that. So there was a project given to look into this T. campestris issue. Um, it kind of had multiple components to it, but it was um, handled by University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, so Larry Hank's lab, um, in collaboration with uh, Xavier University in Cincinnati, and also internationally with uh, Beijing Forestry University in China, and APHIS was involved as well. Uh, so a few parts to this project, one of those was to try to find a pheromone for this thing. So we've caught it several times in traps, but we catch it on a different lure every time. Um, which kind of indicates to you that the lures really aren't working. They're just potentially attracted to the visual profile of the trap. Maybe it's just random, they just happen to bump into them. But what we have right now is not satisfactory. So one of the goals was to try to find a pheromone that could be used to better attract this thing, get a better handle on how dense these things really are, uh, and where they're located. So that was part of it. Um, traps were run both in our area. We helped run those traps uh, with the University of Illinois, um, not too far from here actually. And then they ran a parallel study in Utah 
Uh, unfortunately, they tested uh, three different compounds uh, that are known to be attractive in other species in the same subfamily. Turns out they were not effective for T. campestris. Um, there were other uh, parts of that project, though, too, looking at emergence, what kinds of trees these things emerge out of. Uh, a couple of interesting findings. So again, Prunus was identified as a host. Um, and to me, kind of the real interesting thing is that they actually had sleeve cages put on live trees, and they did that in China and in um, Utah. And the interesting thing and kind of concerning thing to me is that they found beetles emerging from live trees. So this was a big question before. Do these things get, do they attack live trees? Can they complete their development in live trees? Are they only getting, some serumbicids only get into dead trees or, or literally wood laying on the ground? We just didn't know. So now we have confirmation. They are attacking and completing their developments in live trees, at least, at least peach and cherry. And so comparing that to the work done in China, they never were able to um, get an adult to emerge into those leaf cages on live trees. So they're only finding it when they remove the branch from a tree or from uh, dead wood laying on the ground. So maybe it's just a matter of not looking um, long enough yet, but it's always kind of concerning when you see something behaving differently in a new environment than it does in its native environment. So it's something definitely we're watching. Um, I don't think we're totally sure yet. This thing is a huge problem, but um, this information I think kind of puts it back up on the, at a higher level of kind of alertness and something we want to keep an eye on. Um, so just to uh, kind of summarize what's happened in Chicago, being you know just where we're based here, if you're curious where we're actually finding it. The first uh, three years we found it, we're kind of in this vicinity here. So this is the original finding in Schiller Park, and then up in uh, Roselle and Carroll Stream. Uh, we found it in traps in those areas. So at the beginning, it seemed like, okay, this thing seems to be established. We're catching it every year in this general area. That was up till 2012. Um, and then there was one year we didn't catch it, and in the past, that was up till 2011, actually. So 2012, we did not catch it. And then 13 and 14, now it's all of a sudden turning up down here. So trap down here in Bedford Park, a trap in the back of the yards neighborhood in Chicago. And then this was that residence with the bathtub near uh, Midway Airport. That was also Chicago proper. Um, so the distribution since the last time I gave this talk has expanded a bit from Western Cook, DuPage County, down uh, into central or southern Cook County, and we'll continue to monitor it. So back when we first found it in Schiller Park, we, we didn't, again, know what to expect. We had no idea what it was attacking, what the damage would look like, if it was something to worry about, maybe not. So we jumped out and did you know, a quick host tree survey. So we did kind of a buffer uh, one mile around the original detection. So these are the, where the traps were, where we first caught it. Uh, we did a one mile buffer and looked at host trees within that area, tried to get a handle on what types of species were there at the genus level actually. Um, and then we hung up traps. The yellow locations are trap, trap locations the following year, trying to delimit, see if we could catch it again. Um, I won't go through this in detail, but real quickly, we went through and ID'd uh, over 7,000 trees to genus. So really quite diverse, a lot of residential areas, so a lot of kind of artificial diversity in the area. Um, and then not knowing what to look for, what we basically did was counted the number of wood bore exit or entrance holes that were visible from the ground. So we looked at, you know, 7,000 trees, just a fraction of those are actually accessible. A lot of them are in backyards, private land, so forth. If they were accessible, we took a look. And um, so the genera listed down here, uh, number of accessible trees, so that's really the, the sample size when you're looking at the proportion of trees that were um, visible with exit holes or entrance holes. So first column is with one or more holes, and the second would, would be with four or more uh, wood bore holes. And so with the data, we were just kind of interested to see, um, previously, previous to this prunus information, it was thought and recorded that Malice and Morris, this is apple and mulberry, were supposed to be the preferred host trees for this beetle. So we thought, well, if it's here and if it's a problem, we'd expect to see probably higher levels of damage on those trees than on other trees in the area. Um, so when you look at those, they're kind of not so bad. Um, apple kind of moderate levels of damage, um, just 16% with four or more holes. And mulberry really undamaged, 4% only with four or more holes. So at least at that time, didn't seem to be um, too much going on. And so I heard about this prunus thing last year. I'm like, we didn't look at prunus. It wasn't a known host. What, what's going on with that? So we have the data. Um, again, though, pretty minimal damage relative to other trees in that area. So who knows? It could be that that beetle was recently introduced to the area, and maybe we need to go back and take a look and see what's happened over the past five years. 
So I'm hoping in the next year or two to be able to get back out there and take a look at least at those three genera, revisit those trees, see what's changed, if anything at all. So what's going on current and, and going forward? Um, again, we're going to continue to look for it. Uh, love for you guys, um, many of you working with trees to keep your eyes open. And I think what we're mainly looking for is, you know, not so much, I found a tree that has wood borer exit holes and it looks like it's dying. You guys see that stuff all the time. There are a lot of native species that can do this. But I think patterns of decline, when you see, you know, certain types of trees over the entire municipality and a whole neighborhood, they all look really bad in this, in this particular area of the county. Those kind of observations, I think, become really important. And as those things are seen, particularly with this beetle, I would think apple, mulberry, and now let's add cherry to the list, or anything else in prunus, but I imagine cherry being the most common of those in the landscape that you guys might see. So if patterns of decline are seen in those trees, we would certainly want to know to maybe go out there and, and take a closer look to see if this beetle might be involved. So that's what I have, and so I had kind of a disjunct presentation. I just wanted to kind of wrap it up. In a nutshell, the spotted lanternfly, uh, main concern there is cultivated grape. Um, however, it's most likely to be found on the invasive uh, tree of heaven. Uh, currently, it's only known in Pennsylvania in the U.S. We do not know that it's in Illinois. Um, and so we'd like to ask for your help in, number one, reporting tree of heaven locations. Email is coming at the bottom of this slide. Um, and obviously, if you think you see the insect, we want to know that too. And then the second half of the talk on velvet longhorn beetle. So this is a potential orchard um, or and or hardwood tree pest. Uh, we're still watching it, and uh, I think there'll be more research going on on this and more information coming out. Uh, in Chicago, the area of establishment has broadened originally from uh, northern Cook into DuPage and has now moved south uh, um, into central and southern uh, Cook County. And then in that one, um, we'd like to ask for your help. And if you see the beetle, it is kind of a, not a too remarkable looking beetle, kind of an average looking cerambicid, but probably uh, more likely would be again to look for patterns of decline in the potential hosts. So that's my email. And any questions on TCAM Pestris, I'd be happy to try to answer them.